So the most important thing is that the asteroid is not going to hit Earth. <laughs> this is the most important thing to know about having an asteroid named after you, is it's not one of the bad ones that's coming close to Earth. It's one of those ones way out there in the asteroid belt, so nothing to worry about. Can you all hear me okay in the back? I am not a podium person, so I hope you will forgive me for not standing behind a podium. Uh, but I do need my clicker here. It is a great pleasure to be here. I grew up in the West, although I now live in what was two winters ago the snowiest city in America. Woo! <laughs> Worcester, you said it perfect. Although Betty Ann probably could say it with better with the, with the good Massachusetts accent, right? Worcester! Right? I, I, I grew up in Arizona, so I grew up in Phoenix, right? So I now live in the uh, fabulous, um, very snowy Worcester, but it's a, it's a fantastic place. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm embarrassed to say I've never been to Idaho before. I'm absolutely loving my time here. So thank you so much for inviting me and for having me here. And, and a special thanks to Barbara Morgan, who is the person who originally invited me here. And I can never, ever say no to Barbara Morgan. So I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to be here with all of you talking about something that I'm actually really, really passionate about, which is, uh, is about the future of innovation in our country and on our planet. And uh, we have some challenges there. And I want to share with you today some of my thoughts about um, how to meet some of those challenges, and especially around diversifying STEM fields. We all know STEM, right? Science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, the importance of doing that and some ideas for doing that. I will not stand up here and tell you that it is, although I am, in fact, a rocket scientist. This is not a particularly scientific study that I want to talk with you about today. This is, to me, about sharing ideas. And, uh, and bringing our own thoughts together about this. Some will be based on my own personal story and experience, so it's, it'll fit in well with some of the other stories that we've heard here today. Uh, I hope you'll put up with a little bit of the personal angle on that. And then I have a captive audience, so I have to talk about cool space stuff just a little bit. So get ready for some Mars towards the end. Uh, so that's where we're headed today. But again, I also have a captive audience who I would bet most of you have never heard of Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Worcester, Mass. I have at least one alum here. Woo! There she is. Uh, yes, talk to her because she's fabulous and brilliant um, and good looking and, you know, like all of our students are. Um, uh, I will say WPI is what we call it for short because Worcester Polytechnic Institute is kind of a mouthful. Uh, WPI in, in beautiful Worcester, Mass, right in the heart of Massachusetts, right in the center of the state, about an hour outside of Boston. Massachusetts, of course, is a bastion of higher education. It's a fantastic place uh, to be a college student and to, to work at a university. WPI is special. It's kind of your classic New England campus on a hill. Uh, absolutely uh, gorgeous campus. We have about 6,000 students total. So we're kind of on the medium side for a private university, I would say. But the cool thing about WPI, and I own this, uh, this label very proudly, is we are the super nerds. I mean, we have the super athlete. I am the super nerd. The closest I get to a marathon is my board chair says to me about being a college president, Lori, you know, this job is a marathon, not a sprint. And I say, yeah, but championship marathoners run five minute miles. <laughs> so uh, it's both a marathon and a sprint. Um, I am the 16th president of WPI, the first woman to hold that role. Uh, yes. Only took them 149 years, so you know it was okay. Um, so WPI, just really, really briefly, it's it's a wonderful institution. Most all of our students are studying science, um, science and engineering, uh, and we do it in a unique way. So WPI uh, faculty, to their great credit, about 40 years ago, literally threw out the entire very traditional curriculum and replaced it with something they called the WPI plan, which is. Four seven-week terms make up our academic year from, from uh, August to May, so four seven-week terms. Students take two or three classes at a time, except when they're doing projects, and they do a ton of projects at WPI, in which case they can just take one class at a time and have it be an, uh, a project be their entire bit of coursework for one of our terms. Our students, uh, our founding motto is theory and practice at WPI, taking what we learn in the classroom and bringing it out into the world, and we do that um, under this WPI plan where our students go out and work in real communities all over the world. They work in 46 project centers in 26 countries on every continent except Antarctica. We're working on that one. Um, they go, uh, 24 students usually in six teams of four will go with two faculty members, say to Namibia or to New Zealand or to China, four different places in China actually we have project centers. 
and work with real NGOs, nonprofits, municipalities, companies on real problems that they have. And typically, um, one of the biggest uh, kinds of projects our students do are projects at the intersection of technology and society. It's a great way to take what we, we learn about how uh, we always talk about solving big problems, and it's a way to go out in the world and solve real problems for real people. It's a great way to learn that oftentimes, as much as it pains the nerd in me to say this, the highest tech solution isn't always the most impactful solution for people. What a great lesson for our scientists and engineers, how to use uh, their skills to really make a positive impact. So WPI's uh, whole approach to science and engineering is about making a positive impact in the world. So um, I love it. It's a fabulous place. If any of you ever in Worcester, please come by and see us. Worcester is a great college town. We have nine colleges and universities and 35,000 college students in Worcester. So enough about WPI. Let's, let's talk about the problem that I'm here today to uh, engage with you on, which is um, there's a lot of different ways to think about this issue. Here are this graph, and I only have two graphs in the whole presentation, so, you know, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> Here's one of them. So this is some data from the Kauffman uh, Foundation where they're looking at the number of startups in America over the last, uh, what, 30, 40 years here. And you see that the trend is not great. And you know, I bet you, I'll bet you anything here at Boise State, you have a fabulous sort of innovation and entrepreneurship kind of initiative. Yes, some people are, yeah, we got one too. Every university's got one these days. And yet, we, part of what we're trying to address is some of this downturn. So that's one way of looking at innovation in our country. Um, here's just a couple of other statistics for you about why we all should care about this issue. So currently in the U.S., According to the Department of Labor, about 5% of our workforce is engaged in science and engineering jobs, but that, those people produce about 50% of our sustained economic expansion. So those STEM jobs are a huge driver of our innovative economy. A few decades ago, if you asked yourself, where are all the scientists and engineers in the world, the answer would be 40% of them were here in the US. Today that number is 15%. Now, you can look at that statistic a few ways. It may not be a bad thing. It's a good thing. Other countries are training up people to be scientists and engineers. China, India, all over the world, uh, Singapore, countries are really getting that STEM is important and they're training up people. That's a good thing. It's a good thing to have a, a more globally competitive market, um, more innovation around the world, more innovation where some of the problems are to help solve them. But I gotta say, it makes me a little bit nervous as we think about our global competitiveness. Um, and from the perspective of diversity in STEM, just a couple of statistics. So uh, women now make up almost half of the workforce in our country, but they only hold up 28% of STEM jobs. So we've got some um, road to make up there. If one of the things, if you want to just think about how do we expand the number of, of people doing STEM in our country, well, the easiest, well, I shouldn't say easy because it's really not. But one of the best ways to do it would be to just diversify that pipeline, right? Just get to parity in STEM, add more women, more underrepresented people of color into this great uh, work that we're trying to do. And that's a great way to boost the number of STEM uh, workers in our country. Here's another one for you. Today, in, K in the K-12 system in our country, 43% of students are of African American, Latino, or Native American descent but only 15% of engineering degrees are granted to students from those underrepresented groups. So we've got a big disconnect here. And if I, wish, I wish the title of my talk was Lori's Magic Bullet to Fix the Diversity Problem in STEM. It's not, but I do have some, some thoughts and ideas um, about this and I really hope during the discussion period I want to hear your thoughts and ideas too because there's no magic bullet, there's no one thing we can all do to fix this challenge, but it's a really important challenge for us to take on. So I just want to, um, I'm going to kind of walk through my, I got, three, I got three ideas in this realm and I'm going to share them from the perspective of, of my own history and as I, as I think about the things that I think could, can really make a difference, that I have seen really make a difference, they also made a big difference for me. And so I can kind of tell the story from a, from a personal perspective. In other words, um, you know, how do I go from this to, uh, to this, to the president of a really cool technological university? Yeah. Yeah, that's me in seventh grade. I curled my hair so nice. 
It's just, my brothers still torture me with this picture. And the shirt, too, right? I mean, huh? It's all coming back, though, right? Have you noticed that? Like, 70s and 80s, that's all, that's all, all coming back. So, um, okay. So I could also have subtitled this, this uh, presentation, Bad Hair Day Pictures of Lori. So you'll get to see some more. So, woo. All right, great. Uh, so here are my three, here are my three thoughts about um, th some, pr some things that we can be thinking about to, to help diversify STEM, and, and not even just to diversify it, frankly, just to make that pipeline even bigger. More and more kids, we need them in these fields. So um, as I look back on my own history in, in being excited about uh, science, let's see if that, okay. So, um, and I get, used to get asked this question a lot um, by reporters when I talk about space and stuff to reporters. They would say, well, what first got you interested in space? I'm a little too young for Apollo, so I don't remember that. My first big memory, I have a very vivid memory of standing in my mother's kitchen as a 10-year-old girl in Phoenix and seeing the pictures from the surface of Mars from the Viking landers in 1976 on the cover of Time magazine. And I just wanted to reach out and touch those rocks. They spoke to me. They were calling me. I think it's partly because I grew up in Arizona, it kind of looks the same, <laughs> kind of, you know, I think. But anyway, so I told this story to a reporter like 10 or 15 years ago now, and three days later he called me back and he said, uh, yeah, um, there, I, there's, there never was pictures from the Viking landers on the cover of Time magazine. I had this very vivid memory of this. He said, could it have been National Geographic? I said, no, we didn't get National Geographic. Time Magazine was our only link to the outside world in Phoenix in the 70s. I mean, come on. And I didn't read Time Magazine when I was 10. I wouldn't have like, oh, paging through Time Magazine as a 10-year-old to find the pictures of Mars. And so I thought he must be mistaken. But sure enough, I went to the public library, and I found the issue that drew me in to find the picture of Mars, which turned out to be on page 23. This was what was on the cover. Um, <laughs> That's Nadia coming each from the 1976 Olympics in New York. I was obsessed with her as a 10-year-old. For the younger people in the crowd, it's the Simone Biles of the 1976 Olympics. <laughs> and uh, she was extraordinary. Uh, you do see right up there in the corner, Mars, but I'm pretty sure it was because of her that I ripped open the magazine. And indeed, here on page 23 was a not very sexy, but somehow burned into my memory <laughs> picture of the surface of Mars and the fact that we had actually gone there and landed a spacecraft and could look around at these rocks and try and figure out if stuff was living there was just extraordinary to me. It blew my mind as a kid. And so to me, there's a lesson about really asking big questions. Our last speaker spoke about taking on big challenges. I agree. From the scientific perspective, I think we have to use the same kind of approach. There are enormous challenges out there, um, here on Earth, out in space, all kinds of different sorts of challenges that we can use to motivate kids to be interested in and excited about science. So enormous challenges. I also phrase this sometimes as ask almost impossible questions. Really challenge ourselves to think big. So that's the first one. Um, the next one, and I'm not going to talk in a lot of detail about um, all of these different pictures, although the one there on the upper right, um, here's me in the middle with a really nice sixth grade hair. Um, <laughs> great teachers, great mentors, um, even beyond mentors, I think great advocates are really critical to helping kids especially see themselves as being able to succeed in these fields. Mr. Lee, my sixth grade teacher, not so much about science, but just about the world, was the first teacher who really uh, treated us like adults, who challenged us to think for ourselves, who asked us open-ended questions and made us kind of try and put pieces together. I think those kind of experiences are so incredibly critical for kids today. So supporting our teachers to be the very best they can be is absolutely so important. Um, I had some great uh, advocates and mentors, including um, my dear friend Sally Riot over here, who I miss absolutely terribly, who was really, was really, really dedicated to trying to close this valley of death that we get in middle school for girls. And I worked with her a lot on that. And this woman in the lower left, um, you can ask me the story maybe during the questions, but I don't want to go on too long about it. But she was more than a mentor. She was an advocate. I literally cold called her in her office as a 19-year-old being interested in a summer internship at NASA. She dropped what she was doing after a few minutes of talking to me, picked up the phone and called them and said, I have this fabulous student sitting here who she'd literally known for 20 minutes at this point. <laughs> 
very much longer story, shortened, I got a summer internship at NASA when I was 19. That's kicking down the door. That's not just mentoring. That's not just showing you how to do something or giving you advice. That is kicking down a door. And I think for me as a faculty member and even as an administrator now, it, it just showed me, I, I to this day can see her literally dropping what she was doing as I walked into her office for her to help me who she'd never met before. Um, that's a, an amazing contribution that every single one of us can make to really be an advocate for kids to pursue something that they're excited about. So great teachers, mentors, and advocates, that's point two. Um, point three, and I believe the final bad hair picture, um, <laughs> was that summer uh, internship at NASA for me, but, but it's generally what I would call high impact educational experiences. So we um, do a pretty good job of beating a lot of the enthusiasm out of our kids somehow um, in uh, things like you know, middle school. Um, but there are these opportunities to really bring um, true focus and true, truly highly impactful experiences to young people in the STEM fields. For me, it was the summer of 1985 that I spent in beautiful Houston with no humidity at all, and that's why my hair looks like that <laughs> over there. Just the whole summer, it was great. Um, and here we are actually in the lower uh, bit down there in our, uh, our little bunny suits uh, in the lunar sample lab at Johnson Space Center where we got to see the moon rocks that the astronauts brought back. And my favorite thing about this picture is the people behind us kind of peeking in the window like we're some kind of zoo animals. But, um, <laughs> but so we did research. So the truth is I actually got to go work on data from that same Viking mission that had, a, had so inspired me nine years earlier. I got to go do research on, with that same data. And it was like I'd been hit by a lightning bolt. It showed me. It, it, even though I really had no idea what I was getting into. Somebody had confidence in me to go and try something really difficult and to, to really change fundamentally my trajectory. And I've seen it happen time and again with kids, whether it's through something like FIRST Robotics, where they really get to do something amazing. Um, or I'm sure you all have many other examples of these kind of experiences. Summer programs are great for this, for kids. So high impact educational experiences are really fundamental and critical. So those are kind of the three. So as we, again, as we think about trying to expand that future STEM pipeline, we can just ask ourselves, where are the, what are the inspiring questions? Who are the engaging role models, mentors, and advocates? And what are the transformative experiences that we can provide to enable the future innovators to thrive? And so those are the kind of things that I hold with me as I um, look forward, and we can talk again in the Q&A about some more specific strategies maybe that WPI is using um, in the pipeline piece, and truthfully, by the time they get to the college application, it's too late. We really got to be working in the K-12 system to bring these folks um, along and give them exposure to what's possible and help encourage them to continue on the path. Um, but I will just again mention I do think of the whole um, WPI project-based approach to learning at our university as, as those transformative experiences. And actually, we have a lot of data that shows that, that when our students go off to these sites around the world, and, and in these four pictures you're seeing on the upper left, Morocco, on the upper right, students working in Costa Rica on alternative energy, and the lower right, a uh, young woman teaching students in Bangkok, Thailand about uh, water quality and uh, water cleanliness and the importance of hygiene. Um, and in the lower left, it's a Cape Town, South Africa project. Um, again, just four of the 46 sites that our students go and, and do projects in real communities around the world. We have survey data of these students now. They've been out for many years. Where's my alum? Did you go off campus for your IQP? You did not. So back, well, you're 87, right? Yeah, so back then we did not have nearly as many opportunities to go off campus. Now almost two-thirds of our students do one of their projects off campus, and we're trying to get that number over 90%. Because when we do survey data and we show, the projects are impactful for both students who do them on campus and students who do them off. 100% of our students have to do all these projects, so they all do them. It's just a question of do they go and do them in the world. Um, we see that the impact on the students for those who go out in the world and do their projects is higher, statistically higher, impact on how they feel the experience helped their professional career, how they think it shaped their values and their personal approach to their life. Um, we know that it's higher for those that go out into the world and have that intense, and it's intense, um, educational experience. 
And we see that that difference is greater for women than men. So the impact on women of really taking their STEM learning and applying it in real places where they're helping real people is, is greatly impactful. So I think that is one of those high impact educational experiences. Um, I do just want to uh, spend the rest of the talk kind of uh, talking about the, the big questions part. Because I think to me that's one of the most fun pieces of it. Um, there are a lot of different disciplines where you can ask really challenging and impossible questions, whether it's about you know, curing disease or um, you know, managing antibiotic resistance, which is this like $30 billion global problem, huge, huge challenges. Insecurity, whether it's cybersecurity or homeland security or uh, you know, fire safety and security, there's all kinds of great questions there too. Sustainability, how are we gonna make our planet resilient to the change that's coming? How are we gonna make um, communities more uh, resilient and sustainable? And you know, one, uh, a great example of, of all of this and actually kind of the medicine, security, and sustainability all together is, um, does anybody know about the uh, project in Sweden? It's called, I wrote it down, Zero Vision in Sweden. So Sweden, the country said, we're gonna have zero tolerance for automobile death. Zero. We, that, how, what would it look like if we said, we want our numbers of, of uh, vehicular death to be zero? What would you have to change about how streets are designed and intersections about how cars are made? It's a huge, ha big, hairy, audacious goal, right? A big idea. They're doing it. They're actually doing it. And, and people are inspired and motivated when you do that. You know, obviously, we, you know, we choose to go to the moon, President Kennedy. That was a big, hairy, audacious goal. So there are things that can really muster people's focus, attention, and um, innovative spirit. And we know that a lot of that came out of Apollo. But my sort of personal love uh, when I get to be a scientist, which is not very often anymore since I'm a president, but since I became a president, I have actually been on tactical shift with Curiosity, like driving a rover on Mars twice, two days out of two years. So it is possible to be a college president and drive a rover on Mars. Whew. Um, <laughs> But um, it's kind of all part of this field that we call astrobiology, which is the search for, for life in the universe. So uh, if you'll just come on a little journey with me, then I'll tell you a little bit about this field and a little bit about what we're finding on Mars, if, that, if that's okay with you, as we kind of wrap things up. And if I could ask our friends in the booth to maybe bring the lights down just a little bit, because I want to talk about this picture, and it's way more fun if you can really see it. Uh, I don't know if that's possible. Thank you. Um, perhaps. If not, then you can just look at it like this, and it's fantastic. Um, no, it's really not that big a deal. It's okay. Oh, you will? Oh, thank you. Um, oh, it's a soundproof room, so they can't hear me. Turn the lights down. I can, I can fingerspell it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, you, does everybody recognize the telescope in the corner of this picture? What is it? Hubble, right, our favorite space telescope. Uh, my husband was the director of astrophysics at NASA, so he was in charge of, uh, of the Hubble telescope for five years, which is really cool. Um, one, one of our coolest experiences when we both worked at NASA is we, we both got to represent our various organizations at the last Hubble servicing mission. So we were at Johnson Space Center in mission control during the last Hubble servicing mission, which was in 2009, which was really fantastic. Hubble's a great machine. It's been up there for over 25 years now. Um, doing all kinds of great science. One of the most iconic images it's taken is this one. It's called the Hubble Deep Field Image. And to understand this image, you need to know that when you look at the sky at night, which you guys in Idaho actually get great night skies, which is fabulous, um, almost all the stars you see are stars in our Milky Way galaxy. They're local stars. They're our neighbors. Our Milky Way galaxy has about 200 billion stars in it. And when you look at the sky at night, you're mostly seeing those. What Hubble did to take this image was actually um, to stare at a part of the sky where if you and I were looking, we'd see nothing. We'd just see black. So it was a really dark part of the sky. And they, they did a long exposure. This is about a 100-hour exposure with Hubble. And when you do that, when you look at a dark part of the sky that, um, where you don't see any local stars, oh, lovely. This is what you get after 100 hours of staring. And it's pretty cool. So you see there's like thousands of little dots of light there, right? And you see that they don't really look like dots. Some of them are sort of smudgy and things. So this is not, um, there are about a thousand of them. 
This is not a thousand stars, but in fact, a thousand galaxies. So each one of those galaxies, which is kind of like our own galaxy, probably has hundreds of billions of stars in it, and there are about a thousand of them in this picture. And um, you can ask, okay, so how big a piece of the sky is that? It's a piece of the sky about as big as the eye of a needle. I always love the, oh, I get after that. It's so exciting. So in this little teeny tiny piece of the sky are a thousand galaxies, each with hundreds of billions of stars. So this is the Carl Sagan moment of billions and billions of stars <laughs> here in this one tiny picture. And most of those stars are a lot like our sun. Our sun is a very typical run-of-the-mill star. We know that the processes that form stars like our sun also result in disks around the stars from which planets eventually often form. We know that there are, just in this picture alone, there must be billions and billions of planets. Probably a lot of them like Earth. We don't know for sure about any of them yet because we're only just starting to discover planets outside our own solar system. But this kind of picture can make you feel really, really tiny, can make you feel really, really apart from the universe rather than a part of it. But the truth is that all of the same processes that formed these galaxies and the stars within them and undoubtedly the planets within them are the same processes that formed our own solar system. And the only thing we don't know is, did those processes then also ultimately lead to living organisms on those planets? On Earth, we know, as far back in time as we can look, as the oldest rocks we can find and, and decipher, we think that there were living things on our planet, going back four billion years, almost to the very beginning of Earth's history. Very simple life for a long time, kind of like your pool al algae, you know? But um, only got more complex like us much later. But life, life arose almost as soon as it could on our home planet. And so it's a very interesting question to ask, um, and it's one that I think we have the capacity to answer. Are we alone in the universe? And can you imagine a more compelling question to try to pursue? So in my science days, I really um, was trying to pursue this question. And one of the ways that we do it here in our own solar system, if you ask where are the good places to look just really close by that we can actually get to, Mars is the one that really emerges for us. So this is Mars, um, Mars fascinating planet next out from the sun, about half the size of the Earth. About the same land area though, because all, we have ocean covering so much here on Earth, about the same land area as our continents. Um, it's a geologist's dream. These little dark spots kind of on the edge there are giant volcanoes, like volcanoes that would cover the entire state of Idaho. You guys can relate to big volcanism up here, I know. It's like geology nerd stuff. I love your volcanoes up here. Um, <laughs> giant, giant volcanoes on Mars. This, this, this sort of gash in the middle of the planet that you're seeing here is a giant canyon system that would run from Boise to New York City if it were in the US. It's enormous. Um, it has weather and seasons. The axis is tilted just like Earth, so it gets a summer and a winter. It has an atmosphere, a very thin atmosphere, but an atmosphere nonetheless. Um, and the most interesting thing that we see when we look at the surface of Mars from a distance, and I will say it's very hard to see in these pictures, but there's a little bit of it that you can see kind of up here. I'll point over here too. This kind of thing that goes up here is a big channel where water once flowed across the surface of Mars. And the truth is that when we look closely at the surface of Mars, we see thousands and thousands of dried up riverbeds. Today, the temperature is too cold and the atmosphere is too thin for liquid water to survive for any significant length of time. It would either freeze or evaporate right away. But back probably a few billion years ago, it looks like it might have been a pretty nice place to live. At the same time, life was arising on Earth. And we know that liquid water is one of the key ingredients. If you want to have life, you've got to have liquid water to do the chemistry of life, we think. So um, one of the things we want to do on Mars is understand, OK, we see these dried up beds. Is it habitable? Was it habitable in the past? Was it inhabited in the past? Was, was there life there? And so to do that, we send these wonderful missions that are follow-ups to the great Viking mission of the 70s. And the latest one, and the one that I've had the thrill to get to work on, is right here. This is our girl, Curiosity, on Mars. Um, she is about the size of a Mini Cooper, so she's big. She is powered by, a, you see no solar panels on her. She's powered by a nice nuclear generator here on her rear. We anthropomorphize her a little bit. I say she's a girl because she's smart and good looking. So I think, <laughs> I think she's a girl, that's just me. But um, she's got six wheels. She stands two meters tall. 
with a two meter long arm as well that you don't see in this picture because it's a selfie and you don't see your own arm in a selfie when you take one. <laughs> this is her selfie on Mars. This was her first selfie actually. Um, uh, we, we went to this crater on Mars. We're sitting here on the floor of Gale Crater, um, which is a place that looks like it had some of these dried up riverbeds that flowed into it back in the day. So we wanted to land on the floor of the crater and investigate that, and then ultimately go climbing up this wonderful mountain. We just heard about running up and down mountains. This is what she's gonna do, although uh, it takes a lot longer. We've been there for four years now. She actually landed on Mars um, in August of 2012 on my birthday, which was awesome. Um, <laughs> and has been roaming around ever since. She has, um, you guys have probably heard of Spirit and Opportunity, the previous little cute little rovers that have been there and Opportunity's been going for actually more than a decade now. They were great missions. They had the ability to take pictures and um, kind of do remote types of observation, but she has the ability in addition to that, so she has great cameras, she actually has 17 cameras on her, She's got um, all kinds of great sensors, but she's also got a great chemistry lab kind of in her belly. So inside the belly of the rover here and over here are two really pretty state-of-the-art chemical analysis instruments. And so what I want to show you is the results that this picture actually is starting to depict. So what we did here, and this was the cover of Science Magazine where we published our first papers, and my paper was in this issue. It was very exciting. You see these little scoopy guys down here? So we dug into the dirt. This is our, one of our very first things that we did when we got to Mars. We scooped up some dirt, and we wanted to put it into these instruments in the core of the rover to analyze um, what comes, what, what's in the dirt on Mars. Uh, it's, so we took a little scoop, and we actually sort of sifted it a little bit, and then we put about a half a baby aspirin's worth of this dirt into this instrument which has a little oven in it that heats up that dirt. And you can look at the various chemicals that are um, volatilized that come off of the dirt. So what it's is graph number two, get ready, it's coming. <laughs> graph number two is next to see what was actually in this dirt. So here it is. So here, I'll walk you through it. So it's just temperature along the bottom here. So as we heat up the rock, or as we heat up the dirt, oh, to again, it's about three times the temperature of your oven at home up to about 800 degrees Celsius. And this is just the amount of stuff that came off, the intensity. And you see that we got a ton of water. So these blue lines here, and these blue lines over here, at pretty low temperatures, a bunch of water comes off. Now you can't tell how much from looking at this, but through the various calibrations and calculations we've done, we know that this is about 2% water by weight. This is just random dirt we drove up to and scooped it up and put it in the belly of the rover. It's got 2% water. That's about the same as you find in pretty deserty kind of environments on Earth, there are probably places in Idaho actually that have water content that's pretty similar to this. Um, if you took a cubic foot of, th of this Mars dirt and just heated it up a little bit, you would get about two of these out of it. You get about two bottles of water out of it. So it's a pretty nice thing if you're an astronaut who wants to go to Mars and have something to drink or grow potatoes like uh, Mark <laughs> Watney or... <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a pretty good thing. Um, I was actually pretty surprised by this. It's, um, uh, others may, may or may not have been, but so we know again that a bunch of liquid water today is not there, but there's water that's chemically bound up in the soil that's really, really accessible at the surface. So that was exciting and actually we, um, we have found a lot of really interesting things on the floor of this crater that lead us to believe that in fact what we're looking at are the sediments from a former lake that a few billion years ago there was a nice lake filling the bottom of this crater that we're sitting in. And it wasn't a super acidic lake or super, super salty or something. It was just a pretty nice lake. So if you were a simple organism on Mars, say three and a half billion years ago, this wouldn't have been a bad place to live. So in fact, we have found a habitable environment on Mars, um, evidence of it from the past. Uh, have we found you know, little green men? Have we found little strands of DNA or anything really, really cool like that? No, we haven't. We've been looking for uh, organics, if there were really complex organics, say proteins or amino acids or things like that in the soil, we could detect those. We haven't found them. Now it's a pretty nasty environment today right at the surface. It's a lot of radiation and stuff. So it's not clear that that's horrible news, 
One of the things we have to do is sample more and more rocks, because rocks can actually preserve some of that chemistry better. And that's one of the things that Curiosity is in the process of doing. It can drill into rocks and analyze that. So stay tuned on that. We have found a habitable environment, not yet evidence that anything was living in that lake, but, uh, but we're still working on it. And now we're off to the mountain. So this is really the reason we came, is there's this beautiful mountain in the middle of this crater. And even from orbit, we could see that this mountain was full of gorgeous layers. Can you guys see them? This is like candy to a geologist, because the history of a planet is written in its rock layers. And we can just drive our rover right on up there. <laughs> like, that's really easy. <laughs> but we can. It was built to do that and to try and start investigating these layers. And in fact, we're getting close. We're now kind of in the foothills of this mountain. We've driven about um, 10 kilometers um, since we landed four years ago. And just last week, I don't know how many of you saw this. These were released. But, but you can actually get all the pictures from Mars anytime you want. They go directly to the website. As soon as they're downlinked from Mars, anybody can see them. But here are just two gorgeous pictures. And I got to say, I mean, I got married in Sedona. It kind of looks like the one on the left. Um, and these beautiful, beautiful rock layers from these sediments, a lot like what we see in places like Sedona, where you have beautiful sandstone layers. And so we're, we're making our way up the mountain and going to be continuing to explore the site. And there'll be future missions going that have even better capability for life, uh, life detection. So it's, um, it's a really exciting time. It's a really inspiring set of questions. Space exploration obviously always gets people excited. Um, but there are all kinds of exciting questions to ask. And so my, my sort of closing message to you is that we, when we ask these really tough, exciting questions, great things can happen. And this was, um, uh, we had a group of middle school girls at WPI um, a while ago who, you can't really see it up on the screens there, but there were about five women engineers from the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena. And uh, they're talking with them over the video link. And I said, you know, any questions? And every hand went up. And there's just nothing more inspiring than seeing the curiosity peaked in a young person about STEM fields. So let's keep pushing for that. Thank you so much. I'm happy to answer questions. So get the questions up here. Please. Let me start with one. Sure. So I have a degree in, in soft science, so don't get too mad at me. After biology question. Yeah. Ago, somebody started theorizing that actually Earth, Earth is, a, is ahead of the curve when it comes to life, that actually a lot of life may not have arisen yet in the universe. What, what's your take on that, that theory, as it were? Yeah. We have only a data point of one so far. So you can like hypothesize a lot of stuff, and nobody can really check. So <laughs> it's not very scientific. No, it's, um, there's a huge debate raging. There's, there's a really wide range of opinions about this from you know, basically, as soon as the Earth stopped forming and stuff stopped whacking into us at a really frequent clip, life happened. So that might argue that maybe it's kind of, I wouldn't say easy, but it's, it's, it's sort of, in, maybe it's inevitable. I don't know. Maybe if, if you've got all the ingredients there, it's pretty easy to make the soup, maybe. And then there are people who, who like to make arguments about, well, but this or that thing was just right. So it's a kind of a Goldilocks, a Goldilocks argument. The truth is we really don't know. We really don't know how easy or hard it is. And we won't know until we can go explore more of these other worlds and understand their habitability potential and whether or not they actually became inhabited. So it's, it's a really open-ended question at this point. Thanks. OK, so why did you give up your science exploration projects to run a university? Are you crazy? I hear that all the time. Um, it's a good question. So I, um, I grew up on college campuses. My first job when I turned 16, I never worked at McDonald's. I answered phones in the registrar's office at my local university at Arizona State. And um, I, my mom used to bring me to class with her when she, was, you know, when she was going back to school to get her master's and I was like eight years old. It's in my blood. And, and I, I, I went all the way through, was on a very traditional academic track, you know, PhD, postdoc, faculty job. Uh, tenure, um, 
And then I, uh, I ditched my tenure to go join the government. I went and worked for NASA for six years. And it was a great thing. Um, my last job, I was, I was actually the number two in the future human spaceflight program. You mentioned the Exploration Systems Mission Director, which is a huge mouthful. But that's basically the future human spaceflight program, the capsules and rockets that are going to take humans beyond low Earth orbit after we've worked, once we retired the space shuttle. And it also is the organization that's funding Elon Musk to, to develop you know, the commercial space capabilities that have been in the news so much lately. Um, and in some ways, that was awesome. And in other ways, I literally got yelled at by Congress every week for two years. <laughs> and so I thought, you know, faculty can't be that bad. <laughs> they can never be as mean as Congress. Um, no, it was, um, it was a tumultuous time in the human spaceflight program. And, uh, and so the last, uh, by, the, by the end of my sixth year, I thought, you know, I miss the students. I want to go back. And, and so I, I went back in a leadership role. I think there is value. So, so it didn't really answer the question about the science part, though. I, I'm, a, I'm a decent scientist. I'm a good scientist. I'm not a Nobel Prize winner. I wouldn't be. Not that they give one in planetary science anyway. But I, I felt like I had something to contribute as a leader. And I feel like um, doing this work of trying to inspire the next generation of students and trying to help advance really transformative educational initiatives can actually have an enormous impact on the future prosperity of our country, on the quality of life for people around the world. So that's the story I tell myself about, about why this job is important. Do I miss the science? Some days I do. But I really got to do that and, and got to enjoy it. And I am really happy that I got to write my paper with curiosity. And now there are a bunch of younger scientists coming up and getting to write theirs too. So some days, uh, some days I definitely miss it. But I'm also having a really good time as a college president. It's, it's an amazing job. Well, maybe we need more people like you in Congress. <laughs> God forbid. <laughs> so this is a pretty important question. I'm, I bet a lot of people in this room are thinking it as, as parents. But my daughter is a junior in high school. She does extremely well in science and has been taking advanced STEM classes for several years. Yep. She took some labs she didn't enjoy and has decided not to become a scientist. What can I do? to offer her opportunities that might get her excited about science again. Yeah, it's, it's tough, right? You could have that one bad experience that can undo a lot of good work. Um, that's where that grit comes in, right? That, that resilience to really say, that's not about me, that's something else. I would say keep trying to get, um, especially even out of school experiences. The, the K-12, especially the middle schoolers and into high school, this is where we lose. We lose a ton of kids, period, but we lose more girls than boys as they come through middle school especially. Um, those high impact educational experiences, go to your local college. They almost certainly have great summer programs. Get her, get her on an all-girl first robotics team. Get her to a Girls Who Code camp. There are all kinds of, there actually are a lot of these sort of oppor opportunities out there. And I hate to say it because I, I wish it weren't true, but I think some of the um, girls only opportunities can be particularly empowering for, for girls of, of that age. Um, it doesn't have to be if you find the right program. I think that um, there are many that do well. We have a pre-college program where boys and girls come and live in the dorms and take classes during the day. They don't have like homework or tests or anything, but they go to a class. They get to explore a field of engineering or science that they might be interested in. Um, and also they do a humanities and arts piece, which is also something that's very important to us, even though we're a geeky school. Um, and we see kids um, who might enjoy that, but don't have a lot of sort of colleagues who also like it around them really bloom there, blossom there, because they find, hey, there's other kids like me, and they're kind of nerdy, but they're also kind of fun, and they're kind of cool. Uh, so I think trying to get the, as many of those kind of experiences as you can. And then also, um, role models are the other big important things. And it doesn't, it doesn't mean that you have to find like a one perfect mentor. I think some job shadowing, I think, can be really exciting there. Um, just going to get to see what a person who's a real scientist or engineer or vet or whatever your daughter might be interested in uh, really does for a day. And just kind of get them, let, let them see around the corner a little bit. So BSU and a lot of universities, you already said, are investing a lot in STEM. 
So here's the question awesome. of what, what do you see as the role of the arts and humanities yeah. in high impact learning and innovations yeah. and re their relation to STEM? Yeah, great. Thank you for asking it because I, I didn't really have time to talk about how we think about this at WPI, but it's absolutely critical. Humanities and arts, social sciences, absolutely critical to making um, those people who are engineering and discovering the future do so in ways that are impactful, responsible, ethical, um, smart, and, and learning from history. So uh, WPI actually, our only requirements to graduate are three projects. Um, uh, an interdisciplinary project when you're a junior, which is typically the one where our students go around the world. A capstone project as a senior where you do work in your major, again in teams and often for companies. And the third one is a humanities and arts project. So that's either, again, a, a real world project that's sort of a humanistic project, or it could be a concentration in a certain part of humanities and arts. So we, we take it very seriously. We really think about um, kind of creating an engineer, I call it, with the human heart and a global reach, right? I mean, this is a really the only way you can go to Namibia and help people there is to have some kind of cultural understanding of what you're dealing with. And I think it's, we, so we spend a lot of time trying to get our students ready to go abroad and be prepared both culturally and also just in terms of their research methods to do no harm and try and do good. So I, I, there's, there's almost nothing more important than really thinking integratively about the humanities and arts with uh, STEM. Looks like this one follows that one pr pretty well. Uh, do you have an example that comes to mind of some female STEM students going abroad to another country, l working with local scientists and others and helping solve a real problem for yeah. that country. Oh my God, I have a ton of them. But um, we just, uh, so again, most of the, the students who go abroad from WPI, and again, last year we sent 850 students to 26 countries and 50 faculty, also our faculty accompany them because it's really a curated educational experience even though they're working for real world sponsors. The faculty are very much engaged in this. Pro in this. It's a very high impact and high intensity, it's a high, uh, resource, it's resource intensive approach. And by the way, we, we also have a center for project based learning at WPI where we are teaching other universities how to do not exactly what we do, but how they might use project based learning much more in their own curriculum. We'd love to see a Boise State team come and join us at WPI for a few days in the summer to work on that. Um, so we had, uh, but so most of our senior projects are not done away, but we just got a great grant to have students go and work on the Panama Canal expansion. It's like the coolest, geekiest engineering project on the planet. Um, it's, uh, so they just opened the new Panama Canal, right? Did people hear this? The, the big expansion of the Panama Canal. So in the, for the last two years, we've sent um, groups of civil engineering students down to work on it. It's like, your, it's like Mecca for civil engineers, right? And we sent five women last year to go and work on the expansion of the Panama Canal. And they had an amazing, amazing experience. So that's one. Um, we just, there's a, actually, if you go look at the WPI, uh, Twitter feed, or my Twitter feed, you see my uh, Twitter handle up there, Laurie Mars, you guys can uh, see cool stuff about project-based learning on there. I just retweeted today, um, three women did their senior project. It wasn't abroad, it was in Florida. Does that count as another country? Um, <laughs> they created a 3D printed prosthetic fin for a turtle, a sea turtle, who had been, had his fin amputated because he I don't know if it's a fin, whatever you call those flappy things that turtles have. I study rocks. I don't know what the turtles are called. Um, it got caught in like fishing line, you know, this big problem or nets or whatever, and so they had to amputate it. And yeah, they made him a little prosthetic. They got like film of the little guy swimming around with his little fake turtle thing. You're an astrobiologist, <laughs> right? You don't know about turtles. If there's turtles on Mars, I'll learn what they're called. <laughs> Yeah, it's, um, they were three biomedical engineering students, I'm pretty sure. So uh, yeah, absolutely. And we do, I didn't mention this, but we actually, uh, so one of, I'm really pushing to continue to diversify STEM, especially with respect to gender. And um, you know, the truth is that WPI, we actually are fourth in the nation in the percentage of women engineers that we graduate, which is fantastic. <laughs> but guess what the number is? It's like 31%. So, I mean, yeah, I'm sure, but, you know, people here might be saying, oh, that sounds pretty good. 31% and we're fourth in the nation. It's like not, we're not even close to parity yet. So we've still got a lot more work to do. Um, so I was talking with our astronaut a little earlier about this whole world. 
new era of private space programs yeah. in relationship to NASA. Is that our future? Because, in, you know, in the old days, it, it wasn't that way. I mean, they yeah. built the stuff, but... I, I think it's part of our future, yeah. So, um, you guys have probably been hearing about this recently because we had a nice big explosion down on the launch pad in Florida last week, which is really unfortunate. But, um, so, I, I actually really like the current way that we're thinking about commercial space and NASA's role. So, NASA and... Um, you know, right here at Boise, you've got your own astronaut who um, went up on the shuttle a couple of times and a Soyuz capsule as well and spent time on the space station. All that stuff is going round and round around the Earth about 250 miles up. We did that for 40 years after Apollo. Um, if we can't figure out how the private sector can help supply services to get astronauts and cargo to that low Earth orbit, just, you know, again, it's not, I, I don't know, it's like the state of Idaho is probably bigger than 250 miles, right? Um, it's not that far, so if we can, it's not easy, don't get me wrong, it's really tough. But we've got to figure out how we can, we can get the commercial sector to fill that need, that thing that we've been doing for 40 years as a government, and then the government should focus on the hard stuff, the, the risky, deep space, cutting edge of exploration stuff that it's not, doesn't have a business case, it doesn't make business sense to do. And so that's really what this plan is about. It's really about trying to help encourage commercial, the commercial sector to fly to low Earth orbit and to, to use um, and to open that up to all kinds of commercial activity. Um, and I would say near Earth is as part of that as well, even maybe even out to the moon. And then really NASA gets to focus on that frontier that's beyond. I think that's a wonderful balance of role of government and private sector. Now, um, the cool thing is there's like a lot of tech billionaires that all want to use their billions to build rockets, which is awesome. Um, <laughs> so there's a bunch of these guys, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and, you know, the, and, and uh, Richard Branson, and they all want to, they all want to be in, they, they see it as an opportunity, and I think that really says something. They're also finding out how challenging it is, how tough it is. Gravity is real, <laughs> and it's hard to <laughs> overcome. <laughs> so, um, but, but they're, uh, they're not stopping, and I also think some of their approaches are really quite innovative, and I think it's good for NASA to get pushed to be a little more innovative, too. We, it's an extraordinary agency, don't get me wrong. It was an, it was an amazing place to work. Um, it, it had the achievement of the last century that you could argue was the greatest achievement, sending people to the moon. Um, and, and it needs to continue to innovate. It can't be about doing that again. It's got to be about kind of what's next. How do we keep pushing that frontier? And this is helping them do that as well. Next question is sort of on a statistic. You said about 28% of women in STEM fields. Yeah. And do you know if it includes just the private sector? Does it include the government and all the women that are, you know, ecologists, biologists? and working for all the v various federal agencies in some science area. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure it does. I, I would have to go back and look uh, at the detail of that question, but I'm pretty sure it was a national census. It wasn't just private sector STEM. Pretty sure. I'm going to try to paraphrase this, and I think I get the point of it, but how do you uh, talk to women, especially who are interested in things like software engineering, but run into sort of the pressure that you have to be so good in math to do it, and so they get doubtful of whether they can really do that or not? Mm. Um, so I think, um, I think a, a, that a lot of people who are excited about software engineering are already probably, as we would say in Massachusetts, wicked smart. Um, and so that they shouldn't be afraid of doing some math. I also would be willing to bet that while there is some math involved in certain kinds of coding, that, that it may or may not be incredibly intense math for all kinds of coding. I would say find out more before you count yourself out. Um, and I would also say stop telling yourself you're bad at math. No one ever tells themselves they're bad at reading. Although a lot of our students do say they're bad at writing and some of them are pretty bad at speaking. But <laughs> so, so communication is important and not everyone is great at it, but somehow we just don't accept as a society, oh, I stink at reading. You know, that's not acceptable. And, and you know, I think there's a lot that you can do. Um, there are a lot of ways to use, um, a lot of ways to do programming, a lot of ways to do 
um, to contribute in fields that are technological where you're not you know, doing diffy Q every day, differential equations every day. I mean, I certainly don't. Um, studying rocks is a good one of those, unless you're a geophysicist. So I think there's a lot of things that you can do to, to follow your passion and follow your strengths. Um, and I do think that's a really important piece of advice that I give to girls a lot, which is, first of all, figure out what, what your strengths are, if you possibly can, and don't automatically assume it's not math. Just because people have been telling you that you shouldn't do this since you were a little girl is not, doesn't mean they're right. Um, but then find a way to use your strengths. And, and, and you can almost always find a way to use your strengths in a field that you're passionate about. So, Given what you know about, well, science and politics and government and everything else, <laughs> make a prediction. When are we going to land on Mars? Uh, land? With people. La oh. <laughs> Darn it. Already did. Um, uh, so going to Mars and landing on Mars are different things. I actually think it's, it's fairly reasonable to imagine that we would do, and again, maybe you all don't remember this, but the Apollo 8 scenario, which was a sort of a slingshot around or even go, or go into orbit around um, the moon before they landed. They sent, um, so that very famous picture of Earthrise coming up over the moon was taken by Apollo 8 in 1968. Um, that kind of a mission to Mars is one that I could imagine fairly easily, not easily, reasonably happening in the 2030s kind of time frame. Landing is way harder, and it's way harder on Mars than the moon because Mars is a lot bigger and it has this atmosphere and trying to, to land all the mass that you need to survive there. I mean, it's amazing how much farther away Mars is than the moon. It took the astronauts three days to get to the moon. It's going to take us six to eight months to get to Mars. It's really far away, and to protect the astronauts, and that's not even the surviving the landing part. So um, I think that might take us a little bit longer, but I'm optimistic that with some focused effort um, and maybe a little bit more money, uh, we could we could get systems. To, we could get a person in the um, Mars adjacent, let's say, in the Mars vicinity in the 2030s. So, and this relates to that question. Um, I don't know if it's a Star Trek or Star Wars question, but Ooh. what big innovations do you think we will need to make, like warp drive, I just added that, <laughs> to make deep space travel a reality? Can we do that? Do you think that's possible? Yeah, so warp drive, no. Going, traveling at the speed of light or beyond, at least not in our lifetimes, is going to be with people, is going to be possible. We go much, 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 much slower than that. Um, but that's okay because there's still some places, really interesting places that we can go, going as fast as we go. Um, the, the innovations we need probably aren't quite as sexy but are still pretty interesting. Things like life support systems that are fully closed loop and fully sort of environmentally friendly life support systems in space. Um, you know, the um, thinking about shielding from radiation environments. So one of the biggest challenges is, you know, the Earth, we're wonderfully protected by our magnetic field from uh, solar and galactic radiation and and astronauts once they venture far from earth could be in danger from uh, From radiation and this like radiation storms and all kinds of things and it turns out shielding from with from that is is not so easy And what the best ways we do it are very heavy which means it's hard to launch so things like that But what, what would be great is if we could figure out how to help our DNA repair itself from this damage, as opposed to having to shield us from the damage happening, if there was some pill you could take that would fix up your DNA. So there's all kinds of really interesting biomedical research, which, again, I study rocks, so I'm not at all an expert in, um, uh, that can be done to help support uh, the astronaut's survival in space. So there's all kinds of really fascinating things like that. Another big one, another big challenge is plant, what we call planetary protection. So there's literally a person at NASA whose job title is Planetary Protection Officer, which is a pretty cool job title. Um, and her job is to make sure that if we bring stuff back that it's not like Andromeda strain time and that it's safe, but also that we don't forward contaminate. It's our own little version of the Prime Directive, right? Or the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm. Uh, and so figuring out how do you actually send people to another planet without contaminating the planet irreversibly there's a lot of very complicated discussions that, that go into things like that, and it's, it's actually really fascinating. Okay, we've got time for one more, and I can't think of a better last question here than this. If we do make contact Ooh. with life outside of Earth, yeah. what, would, <laughs> what would be the first thing you would say to them, and how would you describe our human race? Oh, wow. <laughs> Congratulations, whoever asked that one. I have never gotten that question before. That is great. 
Um, I would say, you know, we come in peace. And <laughs> it's like, don't kill us, because you're probably really super technologically advanced. And um, yeah, Contact is one of my favorite books and movies, if you haven't seen it or read it. And the book's actually even better than the movie, although Jodie Foster is awesome. Um, <laughs> that uh, it's, it's kind of great to, especially in the book, to when they talk about sort of what, uh, what the contact would be like. I, I would love to have the, the challenge of this. I think the truth is, though, a far more likely scenario is that where our response is going to be, oh, cool, look at that microbe. Oh, look at that bacteria. Because the, the far more likely scenario is that the life that we will first discover from another world will be very, very simple life. And, and uh, because, again, that's the life that existed on our own planet for billions and billions of years. But w the, the kind of complex, nutty people like us and Congress um, all just came along much, much later. Uh, so, so who knows? But I mean, I think peaceful interaction. And then I, I would want to learn from them. I would want to learn about um, kind of what they're made of and what, what's their biochemistry and, and what's their planetary system like. And I mean, that's me, the scientific questions. And then, I mean, culturally, wouldn't it just be incredibly fascinating? Can you imagine? We're not alone in the universe. Getting proof of that. I really think it's possible, probably not with intelligent beings, but with this simple life that we could have the answer to that question in our lifetimes. So stay tuned. It's an exciting time. I think she just told us we're not hiding aliens in Area 51. Believe me, we'd use that to get more money for NASA if we had them, so. Join me in thanking Dr. Lushen. Okay, a couple of quick notes. A couple of quick notes. Um, first off, Barbara Morgan did lead us to Lori, and Barbara couldn't be here today, but our own teacher in space who has been on the campus at Boise State. But um, Dr. Leshen mentioned, and a couple of people have talked about our new astronaut on campus. And uh, Steve Swanson, if you would stand up, please, and, and wave at the crowd, because we have another astronaut with us. Okay, we have two more things for you today. You thought you were almost at the end of your day, but we got two more things, and I want to tell you about them. First off, we have, uh, the next thing is called Food, Drink, and Conversation. And you don't want to miss this, because first off, the food last year was fabulous. So um, we've got all sorts of food stations down here in the Simplot room. You just go out here and you turn right. So go and eat some food. We also have a number of organizations who have set up booths because you know you sit here all day and you listen to this and you get excited and you say, now what do I do? So we've got organizations that are set up down there with a commitment um, to professional development. And you just get to walk around with your drink of choice and some food and ask people questions so it's really a lot of fun and we're doing that from 4 to 5 30. Now one last thing that we've added this evening and we encourage you to come back and join us at 5 45 in this room in your um, brochure it says that it's over in the special event center but we had so many people that were interested in participating that we're bringing it back here and that is a special screening of the hunting ground which is the film that we're going to talk about tomorrow morning Amy Ziering, who is the director and producer of this um, award-winning film, is going to be here with us in the, in the morning. Uh, Hunting Ground is a film about rape on campus. And it's a very, very powerful film that we would like to share with you. We think tomorrow morning will be so much more meaningful if you get a chance to see it. So we really hope you come back at 545. Join us. It's about a two-hour film. So get some food, get some drink, bring it back. We'll see you at 545. Thanks. <laughs>